Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on charities in the time of COVID and beyond. Uh, we've got, I think, in total, something like 300 people signed up, so uh, covering charities, funders, government officials, many more, so you're all in very good company. My name is Matt Whitaker. I'm Chief Executive here at Pro Bono Economics, and had you joined me about 10 minutes ago, you wouldn't have been able to hear me uh, above the noise of drilling. I've got builders working in various parts of my house, what seems like the last six years or something. Um, so the good news is they've gone for lunch, so we've got a bit of peace. Uh, but the bad news is one of them has just laid some very strong solvent, uh, which is making me a little lightheaded. So my chairing might take a quite interesting twist over the course of this webinar. Uh, and if I start waving at you, then please uh, call for help. Um, so this is the first of a series of events that we're going to be running between now and the end of the year on the condition of the sector and its prospects of the future. Um, all of which comes ahead of the start of a, a, a very exciting project, I think, that we'll launch later this year, uh, and which we'll say a bit more on in uh, the next few weeks. Uh, but for now, we're currently putting together the final details for a, uh, another event next month with Danny Kruger, in which he's going to reflect on the review of civil society that he's going to be handing into the Prime Minister this week, I think. Uh, and of course, we'll get all those details to you uh, once they're finalised. And then we'll run some more sessions in the autumn on some more specific questions around what's going on at the moment what the future holds. But for today, we just wanted to kick things off really with a, a sort of high level take on what's happened to charities uh, during the pandemic so far and what the next few months uh, might hold uh, in store. So to that end, we're gonna kick off uh, very shortly with uh, PBE's still relatively new research and policy director, Anushka Kenley. Uh, Anushka joined us at the start of last month. We certainly had a baptism of fire, not least uh, helping to run uh, the weekly survey that we ran between May and June, in which I'm sure many of you um, completed, for which we're very grateful. So she'll, she'll run through the headlines of that in order to provide a bit of context for two great panellists who we're really delighted to have with us today. We'll start with uh, Rita Chadder, who's been running the Small Charities Coalition for about a year now, I think. Uh, and I think it's fair to say has made a, a big impression in that time. The uh, coalition, I'm sure you know, provides support and advice to, I think, something like 14,000 uh, small charity members across the country. Uh, and, and Rita's certainly walked the walk uh, prior to, to joining, uh, having worked in lots of small charities over the course of her career and actually starting her own volunteering career at just 15. Uh, and Rita kicked things off when we first, when we sort of logged in a few minutes before the start of this by saying, how controversial do you want me to be? Uh, those of you who've seen any of Rita's tweets ahead of this event will know that we can expect some forthright views, which is, I think, very much to be encouraged. Uh, and then after Rita, we're going to hear from Catherine Roche, who's the longtime chief exec at Place to Be, the charity that supports children and young people's mental health in schools, um, directly working with children through workforce training and general awareness raising and, and policy development. Uh, and Place to Be is an organisation that, that we've worked with at PBE very successfully in the past. Uh, I think our work has helped to highlight just how effective their interventions are. Um, so we're delighted to have Catherine here with us today to reflect on just what COVID has meant. Uh, in this sort of particular realm of uh, mental health in schools. Um, then once we've heard from Rita and Catherine, we will open up to you for Q&A. Uh, I'm sure by now you're all very familiar with Zoom etiquette. Uh, you're on mute. Uh, we are keeping you on mute, not for fear of Russian interference, but simply to avoid the chaos of having 200 people all speaking at the same time. So if you've got questions or comments, I'm sure many of you will, um, please just use the Q&A function. Uh, you can add thoughts into that anytime. I'll keep my eye on them, uh, try to ask them in some sort of logical order. And for the first time, we've even got the option of upvoting questions to the top of the list. So I think you sort of click on the, the thumbs up in order to push that to the top to make sure I don't miss any of the really juicy questions. Uh, we've got an hour in total, so apologies in advance to those whose questions we don't quite get around to. But as I say, we'll be running lots more events over the coming weeks and months. So plenty of opportunities, I think, to, to uh, express opinions going forward, hopefully. Um, so I'll stop there, um, partly because I need to open a window <laughs> and partly to hand over to Anushka to kick things off with some data. Anushka. Great, thanks, Matt. So let me just share my screen. Uh, great. So I'm going to talk through the findings from the weekly charity tracker survey that PB ran from late April until mid-June. Um, overall, we reached over a thousand organisations uh, across the weeks of the survey. Uh, response rates varied by week, but on average we heard from uh, about 250 organisations every week. 
The idea of doing a, a weekly survey was that we'd be able to see not only how the sector was coping under COVID, but also how the, how the situation was changing week to week. Um, and uh, one of the features of our findings, in fact, uh, as you'll see in a moment, is that they, they didn't actually change very much week to week. So concern was high at the end of April and it remained high uh, in mid June. Uh, we did see some changes, for example, we saw a lot more organisations telling us they'd applied for government uh, rescue package support uh, by sort of by mid-June, uh, but overall the picture has been steady. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we paused the survey in mid-June. Um, we decided to relaunch the survey at the end of, the Jul of uh, July, which we're doing in conjunction with IOF and CFG. So please do look out for the next iteration of the survey. Uh, that's going to be coming soon. Um, and just one final um, it's, it's very important that we keep collecting data if we want to understand that macro picture of what's going on for charities and keep making the case for sector support. Uh, we've had some good media coverage and interest from government uh, in the findings of our survey so far. So the more responses that we get, the more confident we can be in the data. So just a plea to please do consider completing the next round of the survey when we get there and um, encourage others in the sector to do so as well. Okay, enough waffling. I'm going to move on to the headlines from the survey. Um, but just to say, um, all the detail of the survey um, every week is published on our website and we'll share a link to that afterwards if you want to dig into that uh, detail a bit more. So overall, uh, charities are under a lot of pressure right now. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but um, each row of this table represents one week of survey results. So each each bar here represents one week of survey results. And the top row here shows the average results um, over the two months that we ran the survey. Um, the thing we're interested in looking at here is the blue bars. The blue bars represent a negative impact. So we can see that consistently throughout the survey, uh, nine in 10 charities uh, told us that they expect COVID to have a negative effect on their ability to deliver their charitable objectives uh, over this, the coming six months. So moving on to income, um, again, blue means negative here. And again, we can see that nine in 10 charities uh, consistently told us that they expect their income to decline compared to their pre-crisis expectations. And if we look at these darker blue bars, these show us um, the organizations that are expecting the biggest income impacts. Uh, and we see around uh, a quarter of charities are expecting uh, an income hit of uh, more than 50%. Moving on to demand, um, demand is up. So here, the blue bars show charities that are expecting to see demand increasing as a result of COVID. And we can see here that uh, three quarters of charities uh, expect uh, demand to be increasing compared to their pre-crisis expectations. Now all of that adds up to a substantial funding gap. By applying our survey results to the NCBO's Almanac data on income and spending on charitable activity, we estimate that the sector could be facing around a £10 billion funding gap over six months. Um, obviously that's, that's an estimate. Um, we think it's a reasonable ballpark and it seems to be in line with other estimates. Uh, particularly the findings of a survey run by NCBO, IOF and CFG uh, a few weeks ago. <coughs> so in response to this funding gap, uh, what are charities doing? So survey respondents were asked to choose from a list of potential actions and they were allowed to select as many as applied. So that's why these bars here add up to more than 100%. So we can see that only 3% of charities told us that they've done nothing in response to coronavirus. Uh, lots uh, have furloughed staff um, and we can also see connected to that that um, you know, a lot of charities, three in five, told us they reduced activity in a significant way. Uh, we also saw lots of activity around finance, whether that's seeking flexibility from funders, drawing down on reserves or applying for emergency funding. Now, interestingly, this is one area where we did see um, some more substantial differences between small charities and larger ones. So um, these, these charts uh, show the top five responses. Um, so the same 
same uh, options as, as this chart. These are the top five responses, and we split it between uh, charities with income under 500,000 a year, that's the orange chart at the bottom, uh, and those with incomes over that. Uh, and it seems that small charities just have fewer options available to them. So we can see all the bars in the small charities chart here are lower, suggesting fewer organisations have been able to make use of any options. Um, and in particular, small charities were much less likely to furlough staff, uh, to draw down on reserves or to launch a public appeal for support. Uh, and I'm sure that Rita will speak to these points uh, shortly. So overall, uh, not a very cheerful picture, I'm afraid. Uh, we asked in the survey whether charities thought it was likely that they would fold in the next six months. Uh, and we can see here, these blue bars at the end, uh, that one in 10 charities consistently told us uh, that it was quite or very likely. Um, and again, when we split these responses by size, we, we see uh, similarly small charities are a bit more exposed. Now we saw um, some common themes in both the numbers and also in the comments that we received. In fact, one thing that came across quite strongly uh, was that each case is different. You know, charities felt that their particular experience wasn't being covered by headlines, uh, they're not eligible for emergency funding or they're facing quite unique delivery challenges. Um, so there's nothing for, our, for a charity like ours uh, was something we heard quite a lot. Other than that, of course, we have a lot of comments um, about surges in demand, uh, not only now, but expe uh, expectations of increased demand in the coming months. Uh, lots of comments about funding challenges. Uh, an interesting point here is about the need for additional funding, not only to cover income loss, but also the additional costs associated with uh, uh, delivery during a pandemic. So, for example, uh, purchasing PPE. Uh, lots of comments and concerns about the uh, the inadequacy of the government's uh, rescue package. Uh, and uh, we also saw charities increasingly talking uh, about the medium term outlook. So the need to not just firefight today, uh, but to think uh, about the sustainability of, of operations um, after the next sort of nine to 12 months have passed. Uh, and that brings me to my final point, which was asked about what the single biggest negative impact of coronavirus is uh, each of the lines here uh, shows us how uh, concern changed over the last two months. Um, and this pink line in the middle here, that represents uh, coronavirus making planning for the future more uncertain. And we can see here a steady upward trend uh, from the end of May onwards. So that by early June, uh, concern about the uncertainty and the impact that has on future planning um, was the number two concern for charities um, over and above uh, the impact of coronavirus on fundraising. Um, of course, a lot of what I've talked about uh, has been about funding and income gaps, but what's important isn't funding for its own sake, uh, but what funding allows us to do. Uh, and when we talk about a £10 billion funding gap, uh, what we actually mean by that is £10 billion of unmet need. Um, the ability to serve people and communities is what's at stake here. And we can see on this graph here, the orange line at the top, that's the impact of social distancing on the ability to, to deliver services. Uh, that's been far and away the biggest negative impact uh, of COVID on charities. So just to wrap up, uh, you know, we've seen that charities are of course under a lot of pressure, both in terms of losing funding and in terms of growing demand. Uh, and that all creates a significant tranche of potentially unmet need. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing charities focusing on the longer term impacts of this, uh, and I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more about that from um, Rita and Catherine. Uh, I'm lucky I just have to collect the data here, but they're at the forefront of managing these challenges. Um, so thank you to everybody who completed the survey so far, and um, we'll be sharing the next round of results in mid-August. Thank you, Anushka. Um, as you say, not exactly uh, cheery stuff. Um, apologies to everyone for bringing the mood down, as it were, but uh, important, obviously, nonetheless. Um, and as you know, the, what, what's, what the key message coming out of that? It is this perfect storm. This idea that demand is is up for charitable support, um, and actually, there's lots of um, goodwill out there to to provide support and lots of new people getting involved in volunteering and neighbourhood groups and all the rest of it. 
but clearly resources very constrained and that just means that um, trying to do more with less is, is always difficult. Um, we're really keen when, when we sort of relaunch the survey to keep that going, not least because I think as the, as the immediate health crisis starts to fade and we hope it fades, um, clearly the economic and the social crises will, will drag on and we want to make sure that we're able to show what is going on in, in our sector in order to um, keep a focus, keep an attention uh, on that and, and ensure that we're not sort of uh, left behind, as it were. Um, obviously, one of the key messages that, that comes out of that data is that uh, there's lots of similarities across um, the sector in terms of the challenges and indeed some of the opportunities that organisations are facing, but also lots of nuance. Uh, as you say, Anushka, the idea that um, each charity sort of feels that it is uniquely overlooked, um, that its uh, conditions and circumstances are very different. Uh, and of course, that's something we should be very uh, uh, mindful of, I think. And the small, small charity point in particular comes out very clearly that small charities um, bearing a lot of the, the pressure in lots of instances. Although also it, it, it's worth saying that um, it was the most polarized part of the, of the survey as well. So there were many small charities which said, actually, do you know what, this isn't affecting us more so than you got in some of the larger charities. But those that were being affected tended to be more negatively affected than you saw at the average level. Um, so that's what we got from our sort of high level survey view. But, but Rita, you can tell us much more, I'm sure, about what's going on, particularly for small charities at the moment, what the last few months have looked like and what the next few months hold in store for us. Thank you. And thank you, Matt. And thank you to Pro Bono Economics for doing this research. Um, I know a lot of us talk about of fatigue and consultation fatigue at the moment, but actually in a world where we are constantly needing to reassess and look for evidence, I think the more research we can get out there, uh, um, the better. And obviously, please do encourage everybody to um, fill in the survey when it comes out again. So just in terms of um, small charities, placing this in context, um, as Matt says uh, as part of the introduction, the Small Charities Coalition is a national umbrella body, 14,300 members at the moment, UK wide. Um, for clarity, the definition of small that we use is any organization under a million. And just to give you kind of an indication of that whole point around the increase in demand for services, um, for us as an organization, in the whole of uh, 2021, we provided support to 1,397 people through our help desk. In the first three months of this financial year alone, we supported 1,056. So belief that we were, could never have actually even ex anticipated that level of demand and need. In I think, Rich, if you can hear us, we can't hear you, unfortunately. You might need to go for the plan B backup of, of calling in. Can you hear me now, Matt? Yes, yes. Uh, may, may have been a temporary... Stay with me, reprieve. I shall be back shortly. <laughs> <laughs> well, well um, Rita disappears and comes back. Oh, you're on mute now, Rita. Can you hear me now? Yes, that is better. Brilliant. I shall keep this school brief um, in case I go again. But just to say, um, in, the, in the same way, training opportunities. Last year, we kind of uh, supported uh, um, across the year 877 people. In the first three months of this year, 2,000. Um, and we are one of the better off agencies. We're not a frontline agency, but just if that gives you a level of indication about those charities that are working with very vulnerable people during this period and the level of demand that they're seeing placed upon them. I think it's also worth just taking a moment to think about the value of research at this time. And um, one of the things that's often overlooked is actually re research can be a great uh, process for bringing solidarity within organizations as well. And we were probably one of the first organizations to go out with a survey. Um, it was pre-furlough and it had very grim results. And at the time we were heavily criticized for being too pessimistic. But I think the figures from everybody since have uh, borne fruit and said consistently that this is an issue. One of the key issues um, around uh, surveying is also, we've gone out now three times to survey members in the last couple of months, uh, twice around the impact specifically of COVID and then once around the equalities. 
each survey yielded between 500 and 800 responses because there is an absence and a desire to contribute to a debate. And that's one of the challenges for small charities that they can't continually feel that no one's listening to them. One of the first surveys said that 24% of people expected to close completely within the next six months. Now, I've often been asked, well, we're coming up to that six month period. The charity commission's not reporting a downward turn in the number or an upward turn in the number of charities applying to close. Why? I think we have to remember that small charities live on hope more than money. And actually for that reason, they keep going and they keep thinking that the next emergency grant will see them through. They don't actually go into a formal wind down process. A lot of uh, those are also unregistered organizations. So they'll continue working at the hyper local level um, on largely on a volunteer basis. So they're not captured in any official numbers as well. But what that means in practical terms is that when they do close, it's going to be the social worker who was used to ringing up Volunteer X because Volunteer X was happy to go around to Mr. Jones. We'll find that actually that volunteer is uncontactable anymore. And that's going to be a huge challenge, especially for public service partners. And I think the other thing to just kind of bear in mind is that we, COVID has hit us hard, but it's against the backdrop of lots of other issues as well. And the key one of, that, uh, of those is the fact that we are just still emerging out of austerity. And the impact of that across the sector over the last uh, couple of years has compounded the impact of COVID now for a lot of small charities. We have tensions with the regulator. Um, that doesn't add to a conducive environment to try and to support and prosper and encourage charities to move in, in forward. And if I may be controversial enough to also say that we do have an indifferent government. And I think that COVID has actually demonstrated quite clearly that either this government doesn't understand charities or it doesn't want to listen to them. But either way, that's causing a huge uh, um, impact. And just specifically on a couple of Anushka's points uh, um, on, on the slides. One of the things we're seeing coming through is the whole issue and the challenge around when and when not to use reserves. We've had a regulator who has positively encouraged people to build up reserves as part of good governance. And now we're seeing funders also saying, oh, well, if you've got reserves, we're not going to fund you. That this is becoming a huge challenge. And it's interesting that none of the funders have actually taken a clear pledge on what they want to say about reserves. Funders were very quick and supportive to come out to say they would be overall more relaxed in their communities at one point need a collective position about the reserves um, issue as well. And the other key issue is it was quite interesting to see in uh, Pro Bono's uh, survey that only 30% had drawn down emergency funding for government. Now I think for those of us that work closely in infrastructure will be acutely aware that actually that 30% should be a lot more. The, the fact that it's only a third of charities have been able to draw down that money is testament to how difficult it has been to actually get government to make decisions and actually process some of these funding applications. So at the moment, a small charity applying to the National Lottery Fund is having to wait on average around 10 weeks for an answer to its uh, um, application. Now that's incomprehensible for an emergency pot. Um, it's almost as long as uh, the COVID lockdown period. So we have a challenge here to actually try and get government to think a bit more clearly about this. Um, and then my very last point that I'll end on as well is we talk, and the survey talks a lot about equality, uh, about resilience. And I think from a financial point of view, we have to be mindful of the way we talk about resilience. Um, resilience has a lot of connotations around the, uh, um, the, the kind of, disadvantage that lots of uh, equalities groups face in the current climate as well. So when we talk about resilience, what I think we should be returning to is a discussion around sustainability, but not necessarily sustainability of organisations, but sustainability of services for our beneficiaries, because ultimately that's where the charity sector, that's what and who the charity sector exists for. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. That is, that is great, um, particularly battling with the internet problems there. Can I, can I just ask one question before I um, hand over to, to Catherine, which is, um, and I'm sort of, I'm stoking your controversy here a little bit. So where you say um, that um, the crisis has, has shown that we have an indifferent government to, to um, the sector, do you think that is uh, particularly the case for smaller charities or is it just a, a sort of 
sector-wide issue with the government? I think it's a sector-wide issue for the government and I also think it's because government has got a very Victorian and paternalistic view of charity and what we haven't got at the moment is a, a contemporary understanding. The civil society strategy also speaks to a very old-fashioned model of charity. If we could get government better educated on charity maybe we could have a, a better relationship. Okay so, so with that in mind then are you encouraged at all by the Prime Minister asking Danny Kruger to, to run a review of civil society or do you think that is that is just not at all saying? not at all I don't understand how you can have a review without any terms of reference in a four-week period in the middle of a national crisis and where he's openly also said he's writing the, the review already so to my mind unfortunately the Danny Kruger review is nothing more than a vanity project wow. okay well we will return to that question no doubt uh, next month when we when we host that session um catherine follow that <laughs> that we've heard from rita on the specifics of, or of smaller charities in particular but the challenge generally um give us your sense on what's been going on at place to be how you've responded um what's you know what the what the past looked like and what the future might look like i suppose Great, thanks Matt and good afternoon to everyone. I'm not sure I'll be able to follow in quite as con controversial a fashion as, as Rita there. Um, so I'm coming at this from the perspective of, of Place to Be as a, as a ser very much a service delivery, so frontlines charity. And we provide services embedded in schools around the country. So as an organization, income streams coming from service delivery with schools, with commissioners, as well as a reliance on voluntary income and all of the usual traditional mix of, of funders, if you like. And I think I could say there's nothing like a global pandemic to, um, as a catalyst for change within an organization. And I think from when, from when this all kicked off uh, back in March, um, we had been set the challenge the previous year by our trustees to, to really look at, as an organization used to face very much face-to-face -face delivery, how we could go about scaling our digital curve. And I think uh, there, there has been some real learning over these last number of months, and it has certainly aided us to tackle that challenge. Um, so I think the first thing um, was really how we responded um, and what we needed to do to get a, the, to continue a core basic service into our schools and recognizing that our teams are based right around the country. So we're dealing with the individual environment of each individual location and school and our teams embedded within those. Um, so we needed to be incredibly responsive to the individual conditions of, of each school and what they were doing in terms of practice, um, practicalities and logistics and all the rest. Um, and that is where I think as an organization being really close to our customers, if I call the schools our customers um, and our, obviously our service users and then responding and changing over the course of the weeks as their environments changed. And there we went through a schools open for the first week, then school, then everybody going into lockdown. Uh, then a, some of the schools operating and continuing to remain open for some children and families uh, and then through holiday periods. So it's been very much evolving and I think our director of operations would say we've had about four different iterations of our service delivery and service model. So that's needed um, for us to be really agile if you like. Um, I think the next thing to say is uh, the relationship again to the point of relationships so having a core service and there we immediately moved on to telephone support for young people and for uh, and directly with parents. Uh, we then thought what partners can we reach out to who have expertise in digital provision and providing digital services. So being able to reach out and connect with other organizations to complement and build on the core service that we had in place. And that meant that we were able to get in place a kind of a stepped care service. So place to be, core service, uh, then an organization that provides a digital app, followed by an organization that provides online counseling, and then a crisis text line service through mental health innovations. Um, so partnerships have been absolutely crucial and key and being really clear where others have that expertise that complements what we were able to do. 
Um, then the next area that I think we looked at was what we could do in terms of uh, online training, recognizing that that is an area where it would be easier for us as an organization to shift some of the provision. And we were also really mindful of uh, the value that we could add to schools. Um, I should add that uh, March was the point in the year, so as a charity, where we had just sent out our invoices, so cash flow wise, which I know is something that we were all very live to and remain live to. Um, we were at that dip in the, the cyclical point in our year. So we just sent out all our invoices. It's a point when suddenly we're not physically present. Uh, and then you're really mindful of uh, the payment of those invoices and managing that cash flow. So we, we were really keen to make sure that we were providing some service that added real value um, and that would make sure that things continued. So, uh, so we, again, we moved a lot of our training uh, online, again, working with a brilliant uh, partner for online training, uh, Hive Learning. Uh, and then we were able to offer that out to our schools. So there's around three and a half thousand teachers during the course of the, the last 10 weeks who have gone through an online program, which we knew they would need now in terms of mental health support for children, but also in preparation for the autumn term and what we know is likely to come in terms of welcoming everybody back into school uh, following the lockdown period. Um, I think then to, uh, stepping back a little as, as, a, as an organization and um, as a leadership team, I think one of the challenges, challenges also has been about um, the busyness and communication within the space. And I know I've, I've, I had struggled at times with how much of my time do I spend focused internally within on our operations and charity and how much externally in the outside world and what is going on in the outside world. And certainly in terms of the mental health space, um, it's just been so, so busy with kind of government and we already deal with uh, Department for Education, Department for Health and Social Care. So different departments, different initiatives, Public Health England, and trying to understand what is keeping an eye on, what is happening in the landscape, how much time to dedicate to that, and how much time to just steer a clear path or try to internally as an organization. Um, uh, and there also, I think the joining up of charities and collaboration between charities, this being specifically in our mental health sector, has been really, really valuable. So there we got in place, um, thanks to some of the other sector uh, or, uh, CEOs, uh, who set up a weekly check-in call for, for us in the mental health sector. And that has been so useful to try and join up uh, and build a, a kind of shared picture of what's going on. Um, throughout our funders have been uh, super, hugely uh, brilliant, basically brilliant. And so it's so important, I think, during the whole period for us to keep in touch. So that regular communication to keep in touch, keep them, keep letting them know what we were doing and how we were responding. And I have to say, we, are, we found our funders to be so um, flexible, supportive, um, to shift some of the focus of grants or grants that we would have, might have had for face-to-face -face training. They, they allowed us to be able to shift and move those funds in a way. So that, so again, coming back to those close relationships, people really understanding the organization and trust in what you are doing and good dialogue um, and evidence around what we were doing and how we were tracking the activity and could feed back, um, that that has been really helpful. Um, so I think looking, so we've learned a lot. Uh, it has been, you know, a, a busy, busy period, and I am incredibly tired of looking at the wallpaper in my room on Zoom calls, uh, it must be said. Um, but uh, I think there is a lot that we, have, uh, that we have learned, and as we look to planning ahead, there are definitely things that we will, we're not going back, it's really about how do we take some of the learning and some of the, the really great developments, whether that is our online training program, um, we rolled out or have started the rollout of an online program on parenting skills. So it's really helped us build our capability and develop our services with an ambition to be able to do more as we go forward. 
um, because we recognize there's going to be a need for, for um, more service out there. Um, and so it's really taking the positive, taking what we can uh, and looking at what we build into operations for going forward. Um, I think that's all I'll say at this stage. And I'll hand back to Matt. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Catherine. That is um, both a, a sort of good tour de force of uh, the various bits of uh, adaptations that, that, that you've made and the thoughts about what's, what's to come down the line and a bit of positivity in there as well as, uh, as, well as the uh, very obvious, very clear challenges, which is good um, for us to reflect on, I think. We've got lots of questions coming in thick and fast. Um, I'm sort of keen not to get in the way of that, but sort of reading through a few of them, uh, I think we can group some of them together anyway, and they sort of reflect things that I wanted to, to pick up on. Um, and your point, Catherine, um, about partnerships and the important, importance of, of pulling together, um, I think that sort of, um, Rita, you, you touched on this a little bit as well about the way in which some small charities can feel isolated and sort of uh, difficult sometimes to coordinate across. And various people, Kieran Breen, Nikki Wilson, uh, one or two others, have, have asked similar questions around. But partly there's a sort of uh, fundamental question of, do we want to see more um, collaboration and potentially even consolidation in the sector? Or do we want to celebrate nuance and, and maintain independence? And depending on where you fall on, on either of those questions, uh, how then might you sort of work collaboratively in order to, to uh, have a more powerful voice and to also um, achieve some efficiencies? I think that's the question that's coming through. So, I mean, Catherine, you, your, your experience of, of, of partnership has been a positive one. Uh, definitely. I think it's being really, really clear what each partner is putting in and what we're trying to achieve. So it just, you know, it, it sounds very, you know, it just sounds very, <laughs> it's easy to say, but just being really clear what the value that each party brings. Um, and it's actually interesting because two of the organizations that, that uh, we've partnered with are within the, their private sector organizations. So, but who wanted to do, you know, the right thing, who had a real expertise in digital delivery, because we've also thought about, you know, the different dynamics within organizations, whether it's private sector, voluntary sector, or public sector, and, and thinking about that. But they have been just incredibly um, valuable partners. And I think especially in a, in a period of crisis, where we can learn a lot and learn from each other. And then there probably is a reset again and a, a revisit and look at right, what do we want to take for going forward and how do we want that to look for going forward? Great. And, and, and Rita, as, as you know, Chief Executive of the Small Charities Coalition, is, is, is small is beautiful? Most definitely. Um, I think one of the challenges is that we often talk about uh, too many charities and every and it's it's completely predictable that actually we are going to see talk about there's too many small charities around we should look at mergers and collaborations what we often forget that actually in that small charity space people are there because they want to, they're using that as an act of volunteering they're using that as an act of contribution to their local community so on the one hand, I think we need to be very careful. We can't go out and recruit 750,000 volunteers for the NHS and then say what people are doing in their own communities isn't working. And just on Catherine's point, actually, one of the real benefits and one of the kind of highlights of um, the, the period has been the way businesses have stepped up and businesses have been very quick, very agile and very responsive to actually the needs of supporting charities, both at the local and at the national level as well. And it was quite interesting that early on, this time last year, I was thinking, how do we as a, an organization go out and work in regions? And we estimated it would cost us 20,000 pounds to run kind of an, a, a training program in the regions. Going online has meant that we've been able to forge and encourage our members to bring together the new partnerships that are working that are going to be very fruitful and very beneficial for everyone. So I think we need to re-examine our understanding of partnerships and also understand that there's more nuance in it than we originally thought. That actually um, very closely reflects, so Nikki Wilson's just uh, followed up with the from the original question to say, uh, 
much of what she meant was about collaborating with uh, with non charities. So uh, that is exactly speaks to that point. Do you think then both of you, and, and again, this speaks to your point slightly, Catherine, about um, funders and the way they've stepped in and been uh, hugely flexible and, and supportive. Are we looking at a new normal? Or is this something which there has been a recognition that there is a crisis, businesses, funders, others have to step in and support, but actually looking to 2021, um, that might then be withdrawn and actually the, the worst is still to come? Well, I think we are all thinking what is going to happen and, and you know how we prepare for 2021. And certainly I think in our world, um, whilst we have we've managed this period and um, from a from an income point of view, whether that is from the com the more commissioning side and from the funders, um, we have we are weathering the storm, if you like. Uh, I think the real concern is about what is coming down the line. Because if I take, for example, um, the schools with the, with their and the need, we already had such a challenge and recognition of the need and the gap in children's mental health. So we had only just started to address that. And then we hit, we've hit pandemic. So there's some immediate response to that. I think the challenge for schools um, will continue to be their budgets going forward. So increased cost in terms of the, the kind of preparations that they, they're needing to make. There are many, whilst their DFE funds have remained constant, they have also lost income from um, additional income that they might generate. And that was often the sort of fund that they used for mental health support. So we're really mindful of increased pressure uh, coming down the tracks, which we might not be seeing just now, but which we're likely to see in the year ahead. And similarly, I think in response to some of the, you know, the brilliant COVID funds that a whole range of organizations have made available in the immediate crisis, but the challenge is what does it mean for you know going forward um, and you know the likelihood of whether they can possibly continue plus with the economic you know the the economic outlook and the challenge that we are likely to face there yeah and rita same sort of question really to you about you know is, is 21 is the worst still to come um and just a specific question from uh, eugenia migliori which is, it'd be interesting to know charities' plans as the job retention scheme winds down, whether the JRS bonus is enough to keep staff on. Have you got a sense of how small charities in particular are going to go about um, re reversing out of furlough? I think um, it's, it's interesting because, as, as your survey showed, it, the smaller charities are less likely to have used furlough. It may have been a different scenario if part-time furlough had been brought in a lot sooner. Um, and that may have changed the dynamics of the discussion considerably. I think coming out of furlough, the biggest concern that most, uh, sorry, coming out of uh, the current uh, lockdown period, what most small charities are concerned about is social distancing. And how does that impact on their, um, not only their delivery and their interaction with their beneficiaries, but their costs. So they're having to hire double the space, double the resources, even hire double staff to try and meet the same level of demand. So I think uh, um, it's going to be the ease of lockdown and the ease of coming out of that, which we'll start to see in, in the autumn. But also it's going to be compounded by the fact that if we do have a second wave what that will mean and whether that will force a lot of volunteer activity into retreat for the long term as well so that's the big fear that a lot of us have at the moment okay. your, your point about reserves uh, rita various people have picked up on that and said that's you know, a really good point and something that, that rings uh, true with them and various questions coming in so i've got george monk doug crawford uh, nick moore among others just really sort of asking, you know, what should what should the reserves policy look like? What should the regulator be encouraging? And and how might we? Um, well, what, what the question is that how do you educate funders to think about um, allowing charities to have larger reserves uh, but still fund them? I think well, just kind of linking that to your last uh, question around what the new normal is. If the new normal going forward is an ability to, for funders to have more confidence in allocating unrestricted funding, 
then actually I think that's a great benefit to the sector and to funders as well. So I think, you know, we, we, can, we have proven as a sector that actually unrestricted funding can be managed. It's not going to be end up in on the front page of the Daily Mail, et cetera, for fraudulent activity. So I think there's a level of new confidence in that relationship. With the question on reserves, um, credit where credit's due, the Charity Commission have been very helpful in terms of being accommodating around trying to understand organisations' financial position. I think what we need is a steer from funders about their collective view on how re reserves should be managed during this period. The most common question we're getting into the help desk at the moment is, should I or should I not use uh, my reserves? We can't answer that. Um, it's not for us to say in the first place. But the point is we don't have the skills and the assets. People are looking at the technical regulation around the six months, and then they're looking at their own circumstances, and then they're having to kind of look at what a funder is also asking for as well. If we can reduce or we can remold one of those factors, I think we stand a better way of educating and getting the most out of reserves as well. Great. Catherine, um, really throwing back to you the question that, that Rita's had come before around um, the Kruger Review in particular, and we have the Build Back Better agenda from the government. And um, my question really is, is where, where do we think charities should sit in that agenda? And, and are you encouraged at all by the fact that, that the government has, has started this review, or are you, as with Rita, sort of uh, of the mind that this is not something government is a, is a big fan of. So without a doubt, charities have a hugely important role in, in providing services. And really, I think what we're really good at is getting really close to our beneficiaries and reaching out into some of those traditional hard to reach communities. Um, so, you know, on an ongoing basis, we have a hugely important role um, to play in providing services. Um, I, what I hope, I think, in terms of the government is that, uh, that, that there is a, long, a longer term view. So if I take our field of children's mental health, as I said, there is just such, there, before this started, there's a huge gap. Um, getting, addressing the mental health problems and the needs that are there right now was already a big challenge. We've started to make progress, getting to the preventative agenda, which is the real economic case where our work shows if you invest early, you save six pounds 20, you know, down the line in, in cost of public um, services. So what I hope is that we will see uh, some sense of a longer term solution and not moving away from that with putting a sort of a sticking plaster, you know, and in the case of schools, just a quick response, the back to school, and then we'll, you know, we sort of that and then on to the next thing. So I think we need to see uh, long-term investment um, and, and that uh, charities have a real role to play in that and a very rich role. The, the, the question for me and Jones is, um, how do we convince government? How do we make the case for more interest in the sector and um, supporting the sector to be stronger and more confident. Have you got thoughts on that, Catherine? Well, I do love a bit of data. <laughs> so, um, so I think that is, well, that is part of the solution. So, you know, and to your work on the evidence and effectiveness and being able to com communicate that, whether that is in, you know, the more hard quantum stats that we can, great, but equally, with um, feedback from our service users and demonstrating what um, the, the value and the difference it makes for service users and service user voice. Um, that's part of it. Uh, getting government departments who might not traditionally work together, think up in a joined up way. I know we've been saying it for a very long number of years, um, but really that has to be um, that has to be part of a solution, especially, again, I can talk about in, our, in this area, it's education, health and social care, it's criminal justice system. You know, we've got to look at all of those things and look at the impact across those. That's not a great answer, but others no, that, might that, have that, ideas. That, it's not a new answer. I think that is, I think that is a good, good answer. Good answer, I like it. Um, and Rita, same, same question to you in some ways. Are you, are you, are you, would you allow yourself to be optimistic about the future of the sector? Can we um, build our profile and, and, and make ourselves more uh, integral to the government planning? 
Oh, most definitely. I think we should never give up hope and we should always be optimistic. The, the, key, the key aspect here is I think it's partly we need to look back critically and we need to think about three things. Firstly, is DCMS the right department to have responsibility over civil society? What is now the time, especially post-Brexit, for us to go back into the Cabinet Office? Because we, COVID has shown we have reach across all government departments. We need to value that and we need to build upon that. That, that's a win-win situation for everybody. The, the second issue around data, and I'll pick up on Catherine's point. Yeah, I totally agree. Data's invaluable. But data cuts both ways. And the fact that the government can't release data on how many charities have been funded via its various emergency pots, and that a, a number of uh, um, organisations have been forced to do FOIs around that, suggests that actually we need a new way of talking uh, um, about data and we need a new level of confidence in the exchange of information as well. And then my final point around how we could strengthen things, it seems to me we have a prime opportunity here with the comprehensive spending review coming up. And I think, you know, it's absolutely essential that all charities of all sizes get actively involved in that space this time to make the business, the social and the ethical argument around their role. But more so also that we use that as leverage to rewrite the current civil strategy, civil society strategy and start again. Um, we have an opportunity here to reset the relationship and reset the dialogue. And if we miss it, we're not going to get out of this indifference mode for a long time to come. Okay, great. I'm going to ask both of you a difficult question, um, which to some extent your last answers, I think, probably take us part, part way to it anyway. Um, but I'll give you a few minutes to think about it and I'll jump to Anushka with some technical questions while you do. So the question is, um, short of somebody magicking a vaccine up, what would be your two or three wishes for the next six to 12 months that, that would really support the sector and take us to a better place? And then coming off the back of that, perhaps a little thought about what do you think 2021 actually looks like yeah, are we are we talking about numbers of charities disappearing are we talking about the sector bouncing back in a strong way is it a v-shape or a u-shape or what are we looking at um difficult question i know so i'll give you a couple of minutes to think anushka just um i know as we've been going you've been sort of answering uh, questions anyway via text but just to sort of socialize that a little bit we've had various questions come through about the survey just in terms of its geographical co uh, coverage other questions that we perhaps thought about asking but didn't um, and, and might ask in the new survey, uh, particular questions about um, uh, black, Asian, minority ethnic questions and whether we've got any data on that sort of stuff. Do you want to give us a quick rundown of, of your responses on those and, and what we're hoping to do with the new survey? Yeah, so uh, on geography, the, the survey is open to all four nations. Um, we do ask uh, respondents to let us know where they're based. And so we do know that actually most of our respondents um, came from England. Um, so great if you have networks uh, in other nations, you're able to share the next round of the survey with that would be helpful. Uh, we're, we're working with an umbrella organisation in Northern Ireland who are running their own survey at the moment, um, but that's sort of a separate piece. Um, on uh, BAME organisations, yes, so we, we started to ask um, uh, ask organisations if they're, they're BAME-led. Um, this is in part in response to the fact that we know that um, uh, BAME communities have been uh, disproportionately impacted by COVID. So we're trying to understand uh, whether BAME-led charities are also disproportionately impacted. Um, unfortunately, again, we've got small sample sizes uh, so far, so we haven't been able to say anything um, conclusive, but again, I'm hopeful that we might get some more data on that in the future. Uh, in terms of stuff we want to address uh, in the next round of the survey, or, or things we haven't asked yet, um, yeah, good points actually that people have raised about uh, redundancy. I've been dropping things down actually as they've come, and um, so we definitely want to get a little bit more data around um, uh, sort of the impact of the job retention scheme closing. Uh, but actually this uh, this webinar is making me think that it might be nice and, and interesting to also ask charities about the positive steps that they've been able to take, whether that's through more collaboration, um, adopting more uh, digital services, um, uh, potentially merging. So I think they're all things we'd like to explore in the future. Thank you, Anishka. Um, and do to everyone else out there, do keep ideas coming through to us on questions we might ask and, and uh, routes we might go down. Uh, we're very open to that. So you've had a, a moment to think about it, Rita and Catherine. We're, we're sort of into our last five minutes. So this is kind of like your final thoughts. This is your Jerry Springer moment. Um, 
Rita, we've we've rubbed the lamp. The genie's appeared. What, what are your what are your wishes? Money, obviously. Um, I think we need to backfill the loss that is going to be the sector ASAP. Uh, we know that the sector's running at a deficit already. We know that's only set to increase. We need help on that, and that's not going to go away. Um, I, I think, as I said before, we need to we we have an opportunity here. We shouldn't see it as a problem. We have an opportunity. The dynamics have changed. We have a new normal or sort of normal, um, and we need to rewrite how civil society works and how civil society works with government specifically as well. And I think just picking up on Anushka's point around equality and equity as well, I think we, we have in 2021 an opportunity to really address some deep-seated issues around inequality in our, in our society. And if we fail to use this moment, we will regret it because there's no way coming back for this. It, leveling up, whether it's geographical, whether it's across different demographics, is the only way that we're going to have a collective uh, move out of this whole um, scenario. Brilliant. Thank you. That is a great list. Catherine, how about you? So uh, I like to think about the positives in it. And, so, and, and to finish on a high, at a forward-looking positive, um, I think we've learned a lot during this period. So, you know, that builds back better. So when I think about the, the kind of the range of services that all of us in charities can provide, that we are taking the good stuff and what we have learned. So for us, it's about, uh, it's all about hybrid now. So both the face-to-face -face and the use of technology in our services and how we can do more and how that can aid and enable us as an organization and, and make us feel more connected, you know, as a nationally dispersed organization, there's been some really great things about, you know, Zoom and all the rest as well. Um, and I think we, so one set of resources we prepared for our schools and for children in our schools coming back um, following the lockdown, they were focused on the themes of hope, connectedness, self-efficacy and gratitude. And I think those are are themes I would love to see us taking forward and building, building back better. You know, it was earlier in this period, we were all out on the Thursday evening doing the clapping for the NHS charities and the frontline workers. Let's not forget that sense of connectedness in our communities. And, you know, as we go forward, and yes, there may be tough economic times and all the rest, but let's hold on to some of that as a society um, and build back as well as we can with positivity. That is a very positive note on which to end. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so let me just quickly wrap up then and, and say, say my thank yous, because as you all know, when these sessions end, they end very abruptly. Um, there is no sort of shuffling out of a room and being able to corner the speaker in the, in the, in the room and, and have extra chats with them. Um, so thank you uh, to Rita, to Catherine, to Anishka. Um, excellent contributions all. And yeah, we've done an hour. We could have done, I'm sure, two, three hours. Um, really grateful for you sparing the time today. Thank you to everybody who has been logged on. Uh, the participant number has barely changed throughout this whole session, so people have, have come and then stayed, which is always a good sign. Uh, either that or they, they couldn't find the, the leave button. Um, thank you to, to those of you in the audience who we work with on a regular basis anyway, both in terms of the day-to-day -day work that PBE does, but many of our funders here as well, so big thanks to you, and I hope uh, we will see lots of you again at, at some more of these sessions uh, over over the coming weeks and as I say looking at the the, the Q&A and the chat um, there's been a whole bunch of um, questions coming in and actual just comments and commentary and people answering each other's questions as we go so hopefully once we're back in the world of having real life events we will be able to continue to run these sorts of events and have a, a really good fruitful network and, and conversations so do keep in touch with us do send us thoughts and ideas both for specific questions you might ask in the survey and for um, other topics that we might want to consider for our webinars going forward. Normally, it's 23rd of July, normally at this point I'd say go away, everybody have a good summer, we'll see you all in the autumn. Obviously things are a bit different at the moment, um, but hopefully some of you are having some sort of break, because I know it's been a tough few months, uh, certainly in our sector, um, but I think really across the country. So uh, for now, thank you, do enjoy the rest of your day, hopefully enjoy your summer, and we will see you again uh, before too long. Thank you all.